We are here today on a holy pilgrimage to the birthplace of rock and roll. The place is Sun Studios, a tiny kitchen-sized structure where in the mid-50s, a man named Sam Phillips discovered a slew of artists that would lay the foundation of the next titanic wave in American culture. Phillips signed and recorded guys like Jerry Lee Lewis, Johnny Cash, Carl Perkins, and the man that would unleash a torrent of both productive and destructive passion onto the world, Elvis Presley. The music that emerged from Sam Phillips' console board here at Sun Studios didn't just entertain and excite the nation's young people, although it did that at an unprecedented level. The music had a residual effect that no rational person could have ever expected. It elicited pure panic in the nation's capital. To some lawmakers, the music smacked of racial intermingling. To others, it appeared sinister or primitive. Emanuel Seller, the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, decided to enact a law to put a stop to the music that so terrified him. He summed up the feelings of many of his hard-shell colleagues thusly. Rock and roll has its place among the colored people, but the bad taste that is exemplified by the Elvis Presley hound dog music with his animal gyrations, which are certainly most distasteful or violative, of all that I know to be in good taste. Throughout history, older generations have often spurned the music of the younger generation, but only in rare and radical situations like Nazi Germany or Maoist China did governments try to eliminate the art that they didn't approve of. However, in the late 50s, that's exactly what the U.S. government tried to do, eliminate Rock's vanguard, chiefly the Memphis firebrand himself, Elvis Presley. And how did they plan to do that? By writing a radical law called... Just what is payola? Many people, if they've ever even heard the term, have no idea what it means. Subsequently, they don't know the impact it wrought between fans and bands, especially bands signed to Sony, Warner Brothers, or Universal in these first few years of the 21st century. In essence, it broke up the fledgling business relationship between two industries who were never proven to have committed any crime at all. It disrupted the music makers and music distributors developing business for no other reason than a bunch of politicians didn't like the fact that Elvis Presley was a white guy who sang Delta-based rock and blues like Little Richard. And it wasn't just that he sang like Little Richard. What was worse in the minds of reactionary DC politicians like Emmanuel Seller was that he gyrated sexually like Bo Diddley or Chuck Berry. And for that so-called crime, the music industry has never been the same. Change is coming to the music industry. In essence, it must evolve or continue on a path to obsolescence. One group advocating for change is the New England-based Fight for the Future. Here's Douglas Schatz discussing some alternatives to the major label alliance. I think that the best way for the music industry to push back against um, file sharing that sees losses for musicians um, is to, I would say, completely go around the labels. I think the labels are ex an extremely outdated mode of getting records produced, especially given that, um, especially given that um, there's the you know there's such cheap. Uh, ways to record from home now. You know, you've got fantastic technology in both editing software and recording software, and so it becomes a lot easier to record without having to go into a professional studio. Um, and because the cost of making a record is lower, the cost of distributing a record uh, should also be lower. And so services like Bandcamp, which allow for a wide range of prices to be set, rather than iTunes, which has this fixed price and a large portion of the uh, money made from the album going to the, the, the company that's running the, the software rather than the, the band that's making the music, um, that that sort of, um, I don't know, that sort of system is, is kind of where I, I see um, the most success for the music industry. A lot of the major music industry players, the ones who have accrued the most copyrights, they naturally have the most leverage in this new environment. They had the most leverage in the old environment. Um, when we're talking about leverage, it would be nice to see if the artists themselves could get a little leverage. And, you know, we do have the ability 
through services like TuneCore, Reverb Nation, CD Baby, and so forth, of entering this digital marketplace for a relatively low cost, like a, a very marginal cost. And if you're selling records that, you know, it's, it's not a big deal, or, or if you're, you know, if people are interested in, in your music, it's not a big deal to uh, pay folks like that who are sort of acting as, uh, you know, a platform or a springboard to, you know, this, this digital environment. On the other hand, they don't do anything in terms of promotion or, you know, and that's the thing that, that a label would traditionally do. I think labels still have a role to play. I, I, I would love it if they weren't approaching this new environment with the idea that they can just extract the most value from it and screw everybody else. Because to me, a label does two things. If, if a label's doing, doing their job, they're doing two things. They're creating a curated experience, a curated experience through their roster. They're creating a brand that you can trust. This is why the independent labels did, you know, did better to, to a large degree in the digital transition, because they know how to sell to consumers, uh, to their fans. The irony here is that humans have spent the last thousands of years trying to build libraries when building a library was a really hard thing to do. You, know, you needed to amass tons of books or records or whatever it was you were trying to store. You needed to keep them safe. You needed a building to put them all in. And now we have this medium, the internet, that's ideal for building a library. It's, it's what it does. It makes it so easy to create these massive collections of, of culture, um, and not just the things that we used to consider culture, but everyone's expressions. You know, every, any video somebody makes, anything anyone writes. And there's a way to do it so that not only does everyone have open access to this, but also all of the creators get paid. And it's, it's really pretty simple. We already do it with radio. The thing is, we already do it with radio. When radio first started, the, the, the record labels and music, musicians were like, hey, these ra this, this new technology, they're taking our music and they're playing it for free and we're not getting any money from it. So, uh, so how did they figure that out? They didn't want to kill radio. Um, so what they did was they created uh, systems where every radio station would pay into a pool and that money they paid in would get divided up according to which artists they played the most. Um, we already have that. It already works. It works in almost every country in the world. It's been working for years. It's not completely fair, and there's a lot of questions about exactly how the money gets d divided up and whether it's efficient, but it works. Right? Um, and it's so easy to do that with the internet. Ever since the beginning, it's been so easy to do that with the internet. All you have to do is track what, uh, what stuff is the most popular, which there's a million ways to do, and, and tons of sites and services do that already and you need to collect a license fee from, from, from users or from internet providers, from websites, from somebody. You create some way that if people pay in, they don't have to worry about getting sued, they don't have to worry about, about what, you know, what clips of what songs they're using or samples or whatever. They don't have to worry about lawyers or anything. They just pay in and they can do what they want and it works. Right? It'd be so easy to do. And the only reason why we haven't done it is that we have this cartel of a few big record companies that frankly stand to gain nothing from a system like that. Because a system like that would connect every single musician or author or filmmaker directly with the fans that love their stuff. And they would get paid automatically just by virtue of one of their things becoming popular. So you wouldn't need a label anymore. And so the labels ha have never seen this obvious, obvious, amazing solution as something that worked for them. And so we don't have it. It never, it never happened. The, actually, the model for Sopa and Pipa were really great. I think you've really got to get people jazzed about the idea of bringing the, the, the music back to the musicians rather than the labels. Um, and uh, say, same with the, the flow of money, back to the musicians, not the labels. Um, and the, currently, there's so much, I, I feel like there's a lot of press out there about how, um, y you know, and that I think there's a lot of press about how the music industry is collapsing and how much money they're losing. And I think that that press is directly coming from the labels themselves rather than the musicians. Often when you read these sort of news articles about how much money the music industry is uh, losing, they're pointing not to the lifestyles that musicians are leaving, but rather, rather to the amount of money the labels themselves are losing. The music industry has a rather lengthy history of dealing with issues that are either illegal or uh, are being closely aligned with illegal activities. Uh, for instance, the payola scandal. And then 
after that, several people in organized crime had very close links with the music industry. The music industry has a very powerful lobby. Are these all factors that can enter into why they've been left relatively untouched when other industries have been regulated? Quite probably.